We're sisters, best friends, and authors on a mission to help you stoke your creative fire and live the life of your dreams. We believe that purpose fuels passion and that creativity is your secret weapon for mass construction. There's never been a better time to bless the world with your dream realized. You're listening to The Kate and Abby Show. What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of The Kate and Abby Show. Today, we're talking all about building suspense and tension in a story. Basically, how to keep your reader on the edge of their seat. Suspense is a vital arrow to have in your literary quiver as a writer, even if you don't write a particularly suspenseful genre. Yes, it's totally possible to have your readers in suspense, even if you write a genre like contemporary romance. So in this episode, we're going to show you a few different ways to pull that off, as well as the pros and cons of using different plot devices. So before we get started, we have to thank our sponsors, who are you. You guys are the ones who keep this show going, and we appreciate you so much. So if you get value out of this podcast, go to patreon.com slash the Kate and Abby show and help us keep this podcast alive and free of interruptions. And actually, this episode is a request from one of our patrons. Um, So when you're in the Patreon, you can DM us and we'll get your message, and you can request show topics. And of course, you can suggest show topics on YouTube as well, if you are watching the YouTube video. But we're more likely to see your direct message, and we can chat back and forth, and it's really fun. You get exclusive benefits in the Patreon, so definitely check that out. Sometimes we'll put out like polls and stuff if we're like torn between a few episodes and be like, hey. Voting power, yes. Yeah, voting power. So that's cool. You get to kind of influence what we're doing here on the show. Yeah, that's another perk. So this request came in from our patron, Leah, and she asked for tips to build suspense or tension, especially when your story is told from one point of view. My story is told only from the MC's perspective, third person deep, so the reader discovers everything with her equals lots of cool surprises, but I also love when the reader knows things before the MC. The only solution I found is to make this, to make this work is to switch to third person omniscient or add a second point of view. Thoughts on this? So there's a few different like pros and cons to using first person or third person deep or third person close, whichever you prefer to say, um, or omniscient, like an omniscient view of everything that's happening or switching point of views. There's like so many options here. So um, from our perspective, writing various genres kate writes more of uh cont- or not contemporary thriller thriller um fantasy fantasy urban fantasy with a little bit of paranormal sprinkled in there um and i write mostly contemporary romance so we both write suspense into yes. our stories but from totally different angles so i think this will be an interesting discussion for that reason because i've had so many people this is bunny trail but i've had so many people who read 100 Days of Sunlight and said that they were like on the edge of their seat, especially towards the end. Right. (laughs) And that the ending was like so suspenseful and that they like stayed up all night reading the end. Um, Like so many people have said that. And I'm like, that's so cool to see. But it's also kind of goes to show that even in contemporary romance, you can find ways to make um, a scenario suspenseful. Right. You know, I think people mistake suspense for like this, like, thing you know what i mean (laughs) it's not always that it doesn't have to be like this you know thriller uh vibe it doesn't have to be like a thriller horror you know thing to be like you know she's opening the door there's a monster yeah like that's like our little thumbnail of what thrill of what suspense can be but it's really in everything what suspense really is is that feeling of oh i need to see what happens next Mm-hmm. That's really what you're held in suspense. Right. You There are a few things hanging, suspended, that you want to see how they tie up. Right. That's really what suspense is in a way. Right. Um, and it can be used in d- lots of different ways. Like as you were talking 
um, a moment ago, what came to my mind is the show Downton Abbey does a really great job of including suspense in almost all the episodes. And that's a very, anyone who's watched the show knows that it's not like a, a violent thriller, okay? It's like very mellow stuff happening most of the time. But we have so many intricate characters and internal conflict that is causing us to be held in suspense. Right. Yeah. So it's really more of a device that can be used in different ways. Exactly. Not so, so much a one size fits all. Right. It's it's tension, you know, it's like right. an unanswered question, but part of it is there. So there there's definitely something you know for sure. I think that's always an element that that uh, suspense always has the element of you know that one thing is going to happen for sure, or a few things are going to happen for sure. And by that I mean like you know for a th for like a thriller example, you know she's gonna walk into the you know the basement or whatever, and there's something creepy in the basement. So you know that she's going to do this thing. You know there's something creepy in the basement. You don't know what's going to happen when that occurs. You know what I mean? So that was like the scenario in the end of 100 Days of Sunlight, which I won't spoil it. I won't say what it is, but <laughs> you know something for sure. Like you know that this scene is going to unfold, but you don't know what the outcome of the scene is going to be. So that I think contributes to the tension and the suspense. Yeah, yeah you did that really well in 100 Days. Thank you. Now that I'm like thinking about <laughs> it, like I'm like, yeah, there's so you're like, like so much. You're anticipating something because you you're anticipating it because you can guess what might happen. So that's like what I've always resorted to with story structure and any kind of writing thing really is I know something is going to happen here. <laughs> it's so hard to describe. Like I know something for sure, but there is also unanswered questions. Right. You know what I mean? So keeping a, per keeping a reader in suspense has to do with setting up the scenario for the question to be answered. Mm -hmm. But you also have elements already in place. Right. There has to be like a few known factors. Yeah, exactly. A few known factors and an unknown. Yeah. That have you like right? Oh, there has if to that be an happens, unknown. Then this will happen. But if the whole thing's unknown, then there's no suspense. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it's like a total surprise. There's I did right. a, I did a video on how to write a pinch point, and I talked about suspense a lot in that video. Um, and in that video, I read this big long quote by Alfred Hitchcock that's about suspense, and it's very very good and just like completely describes it. And to paraphrase, the quote goes into talking about how. If you have an explosion go off in a scene in a movie, everybody's surprised by the explosion because they didn't see it coming. But if you see the person planting the bomb and then you wait and you see these people having a conversation in the same room where the bomb is planted and now you're in suspense for 15 minutes versus you being surprised for 15 seconds when the bomb went off. So that essentially is suspense, is the waiting, the anticipation of the thing that's going to happen. So you don't know what the outcome of the bomb going off will be, but you do know that it's going to go off. So it doesn't right. take like, oh, well, I'm bored with this now because I know what's going to happen. Well, you don't know everything that's going to happen. You exactly. Know? So there is some unknown, but there's also the known. Right. Yeah, yeah, exactly, for sure. So you have to have like that recipe of we know a few things enough to cause us to feel suspense. Right. If we don't know anything, we don't feel anything. We're just kind of like uh, the story's kind of just bumping into us. Right. Whereas if a few things are set up, yeah, what comes into my mind is like, oh, what's it called? A Quiet Place, that movie. Yeah, which I never even watched, but like I I, wa I saw someone else watching it in the seat in front of me on yeah. an airplane. Long story, like head is splitting headache, so I'm like silently watching this movie <laughs> you that can I can't even hear. Yeah, I know the whole thing has <laughs> subtitles, so like I watched most of this movie. I'm like, oh, I have such a headache. It was a weird combination of things. Anyway, <laughs> so the I remember seeing a part where you know, okay, whole premise is they have to they have to be quiet because the aliens come eat them. Right. Um, and so there's a part where she's like going up the cellar steps and we see a little nail sticking up and we're all like, oh, someone's going to step on that nail. That nail's going to find someone's foot at some point. So now we're in, we're like, and it's like nothing happens with it till like the end or something. And of course she steps on and screams and has to run away from the monster or something. 
But what that does is, okay, we know a few things. Yeah. We know, okay, here's the, here's the setting. Set up. These monster thingies are running around trying to eat these people if they make a noise. What makes someone make a noise? A nail sticky in their foot. Isn't she also pregnant? Yes. So it's like you're anticipating that the whole time. Like, okay, this isn't going to be good. <laughs> right, exactly. So, so, but that would be no suspense at all if there wasn't like the setup of the fact like, okay, here's how this system works. These exactly. aliens, if they hear a noise, go and eat the thing that made the noise. So now we know that. Now we see the nail. Now we know, oh, that's going to be a problem. And th so we have these things that get set up. Right. Yeah. That cause us to be like, okay, we don't know what's going to happen right. or when it's going to happen. But we have those known things that are already set up to yeah. cause us to be in suspense. Right. You've already raised the stakes and created the rules, right. sort of. And now... The unknown is just the outcome. So yes. how do you create the knowns? I guess that's really what the question is. Is like in in our patron Leah's case, her story is third person deep point of view. So it's third person, but you only know what's going on in this one character's head. And if that's the case, then there really has to be some sort of other knowledge that the reader can acquire that they can see something beyond the scope of what this one character sees, because that's really where that's where the vicarious suspense comes in, which is what I talked about in the pinch point video, um, where you're anticipating something and dreading something for the character sort of. <clears throat> so yes, the character can also be dreading it and anticipating it, but you have to know more than the character Right, I almost feel like you could drop clues. <clears throat> yeah, that um, like uh, some like give me your opinion on this. Uh, what comes to my head is the film uh, A Beautiful Mind, mm -hmm. which is very much you're submersed in the point of view of John Nash. Right, very much like yeah. you are not separated from his innermost being for a long time. You're seeing everything from his perspective, but there are actually some clues that go by. That when you watch the movie for like the second or third time, you're like, yeah. oh, That's the thing, that though. was a clue. Oh, that was a clue. Yeah. That was a clue. That was a clue. And so we're seeing those clues from his point of view. Mm -hmm. You might notice them. You might not. So you can actually, I think, draw the reader's attention to like, oh, here's this thing. And maybe the, the character themselves doesn't think anything of it, but the reader's like, hmm, I wonder if that's going to come to right. rear its head later on. Yeah. You know what I mean? Right. Like, I feel like that can be a thing that you can use when you're it writing can, from just for sure. one perspective. But it'll probably be like more that. surprising when the thing's revealed. Because, mm. like, I was very surprised in a beautiful Yeah, world. I was too. Because that's like a plot twist. And you're like, oh my gosh, what just happened? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but that's true. the clues do make it so much richer, especially mm. reading it a second time. But that is that is a good example because... The clues are obvious to the when you start when you like watch it a second time you're like oh wow that's like so obvious I can't believe I didn't notice that um, so you can do that for sure with a with a single point of view and um, I think that a lot of times when writers think about adding a point of view they kind of are hesitant to do that because they feel like they have to be committed to that now and like keep going back to that point of view, but you really don't have to do that. Yeah. You know, like you can just put it in for however long it serves you. Like if you're watching a film, for instance, and it goes away from the main character to go to like the villain for a few minutes, then you see the villain plotting something against the main character. Now you have suspense because you see something that's going to happen to the main character, but the main character doesn't know about it. And you don't feel like, oh, I want to keep going back to the villain now. Like, you only need to see the villain and what they're doing for as long as it serves the story and for as long as it keeps building the tension and suspense. Right, and that's actually where a lot of um, 
like television shows and film productions kind of go wrong and become boring and lose their audiences when it's like, well, no, we have to keep going back to them even when like nothing's yeah. happening. It's like no one cares. Yeah. Well, why does it matter? You right, know, like exactly. you always say, it has to it has to matter and it has to have a point. And like what jumped to my head as you were saying that something I've always personally enjoyed and this is a taste thing, obviously, is having an unknown perspective that's inserted. And maybe it's just a small piece. So let's say it's like the super villain mastermind trying to like hunt down the main character. And now we're seeing like maybe we're watching them from some yeah. unknown perspective. And now I know like, ooh, they're being followed by somebody, but I don't know what. Yeah. You know, even if it's just like a little preface thing you put at the beginning of some chapters. Mm. Yes. That creates like, which I did in Worlds Beneath. Yes. I was literally, so. <laughs> I'm like, keep waiting to, to <clears throat> mention that. Like Worlds Beneath, okay, Katie's second book in the Blood Race series is like the most suspenseful book you'll ever read. Okay. <laughs> it's just so good. Oh my God. And like the middle, like the midpoint, like big plot twist realization is really like the plot twist realization for like the whole series as well. But it is so good. And she pulls it off with three different point of views. So three three point of views, first person. But like you said, you have the unknown narrator mm -hmm. who is the villain. Yeah. <laughs> and throughout the book, you just keep seeing more and more as their perspective opens up more and more. And then you start to get it at some point. You're like, oh my gosh, that's them. <laughs> exactly. And you realize like the full picture comes into view and it's so good because the main characters are none the wiser. Right. So they're you're way smarter than everybody at this point. Which feels good. Yes. As a reader, you don't want to be like, what? Trying to keep up with the main <laughs> character the whole time. Yeah. It's like, okay. It's know. like it's like the uh, Sherlock effect. <laughs> Sher say that. Sherlock like <laughs> solves everything in like two seconds of really great editing and you're like, what? what? Yeah. What just happened? Yeah, I guess that was, you know, cool, but I don't get it. Very He's clever. smarter than me. He's I'm more sure clever than me. sure that was very clever. Like, it's, it's, <laughs> it can work sometimes, but right. most of the time... That, yeah, that's like a great example of like a, a show that had <laughs> other redeeming qualities that saved yeah. it. But dang, it was like... Uh, can someone just explain to me why? Yeah, you have to make the, you have to make yes. the audience feel clever and yeah. understand what's going on. Right. Just as well, if not better than the characters, mm -hmm. because that gives us a much more immersive experience and it allows us to feel things like suspense rather than just surprise and then confusion. And then I have to think about it for the a day more and a surprise half, and then, and then more I confusion. start to piece it together. Right. You know, so it's it's a way better to inform the audience whenever you possibly can. So to pull that off, you don't have to commit to a second point of view forever. Like it can just be. I go to this point of view whenever I need to show the reader a glimpse of something or an unknown point of view. And with what you did with Worlds Beneath was not even necessarily a point of view. Like it wasn't even officially a point of view. It was just like journal entries. Mm -hmm. um, but it showed us enough of that character's perspective. And so so play around with it, I think. Right. The The best discoveries usually happen through creativity and just kind of letting your creativity run wild yeah and try new things right exactly one another one that comes to my mind is if you are like oh you know what i really don't want to do a, a a second point of view per se you can always utilize the prologue mm. to set up something that will cause suspense so let's say the prologue is it can be third person can be whatever point of view you want uh let's say the premise is you know someone burying a mysterious box in the woods okay and we have a very specific setting with this oak tree with carvings on it and now we've this unknown character has buried something there and runs away and then that part ends and then we go through the story and eventually our main character now we find ourselves oh we're walking through the woods and there's this tree with this and you're like oh ooh, that was where this happened or we know that that person was hanging out here and so that creates a little sp suspense without having to include a point of view if you're like, no, I really want it to be cleanly one person. You can kind of utilize that beginning bit to create a setup or do something uh, artsy and entirely different from what the rest of the book is going to be. And then people right from page one have a little bit of like, hmm, I wonder where that's going to come in. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great idea. I like that a lot. Um, so yeah, trying new things I think is 
is something that is it's always worth trying something new and creative. Right. You know? There's no rules. Like to try lots of different things. And the thing is, is you can always go back and edit it. If you're mm-hmm. like, oh, I don't like that. Or, oh, I thought of something else. You know, I just finished a book that I, I'm actually going back and rewriting the beginning of it. And I just finished, it's like uh, 215,000 words. And I'm like, oh, you know, I'm going to rewrite the beginning. Because there's, there's no like rules. <laughs> there's no rules here. Feel free to experiment with different things. And then maybe halfway through the book, you hit a certain point and you're like, oh, you know what? I should take this thing happening now and hint it at the beginning. Yeah. So oh, you also, don't always have to like know from the get go. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Also, um, the future scene thing, which I know we talked about a little bit in the prologue video or prologue podcast that we did about prologues is like like taking a scene that's going to happen to your main character in the future and then bringing it to the beginning to make that the prologue or a piece of it the prologue i've seen that done before and if it's done well it can actually create the suspense that you want you don't want it to be too confusing but if you can tell like oh this is something that's going to happen like at the end or later on in the book and now you're like waiting for that scenario to unfold you know? Right. So that's another way to create suspense without switching point of views. But I would care way more about making sure you're informing the audience, informing your reader, and making them more aware and smarter than the characters. That's always more important than, oh, I don't want to switch point of view or oh, I'm not sure if this like will be jarring to go over to this point of view or to show like this journal entry or this letter or something. It's always better to err on the side of giving the reader more information and making them more aware of what's happening so that they can better anticipate what will happen later in the book than to hold back and keep them unaware and unintelligent until the end and then it's like surprise uh, here's what was happening the whole time because we can't enjoy that as much because there's no anticipation of things that will happen yeah it's far more satisfying for the viewer or the reader to have some hints and clues that they can be piecing together themselves because what that does is it um it's mentally engaging them in the story more. It's actually making them part of the story rather than an outside observer. They're actually actively piecing it together themselves, which creates a stronger connection and bond to the story than if they're just like, I don't know what's happening, so I'll just keep reading. They feel like I'm the observer, not a participant. Mm -hmm. If you can get them to be a participant, then it's like next level engagement. They're really engaged. They, They will respond differently yeah than they would just as someone observing something that they won't understand till the end of the story right yeah exactly and i always recommend that writers do this but study your favorite stories that have really great suspense or tension in them if you find yourself like on the edge of your seat while watching a particular movie or a tv show or reading a particular book then stop and ask yourself, well, what is this about? What is it about this book, about this story, this movie, whatever, that's making me so like, I have to know what happens next. So on the edge of my seat, why am I in such suspense reading this or watching this? And when you start asking yourself those questions, you start to uncover the answers, the secret ingredients, as I like to call them. Um, I'm actually going to be putting out a video, I think this Wednesday, about... um, analyzing stories so keep an eye out for that one if you um follow my channel which you should if you don't (laughs) go do that yes for sure but the thing is like you can learn so much from just from observing the stories that you like the best and seeing how different authors and writers utilize these different plot devices that we are talking about here so do you see everybody's perspective? Is that is what is that's what's creating the suspense? Or are you just in one person's, one character's perspective? And if so, how are you able to feel suspense for them, either through clues or some known information or anything? <laughs> what what is the element here? Um, and asking yourself those questions, coming up with those answers for multiple things, particularly, like that would be what I'd highly recommend is like study multiple stories and then look for patterns Mm -hmm. and see what is the pattern here? 
what is the method to this madness? Right. <laughs> you know. And also notice stories that feel unsatisfying. And yeah. be like, why? Like me and Abby discuss this all the time. Everyone hates watching movies with us. <laughs> hates it. Yep. We Why talk, you we talk the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> I can't even hear it. We talk, we, yeah, <laughs> exactly. We Everyone like, hates <laughs> watching movies with us. We're like, oh, you know why that, that, that feels unfulfilling because this character didn't have enough internal conflict. Everyone's just, it's just a movie. <laughs> yeah. It takes like but three times not, as long because we yeah. have to rewind all the things. Rewinding the things. Yeah, <laughs> we do. Like, wait, oh what? So what did they even say? Because we talked through the whole scene. Um, but ask yourself, why does that feel unsatisfying? Why am I not satisfied? Why am I not excited? Why do I? Why did I stop watching this series? And answer those questions too, because that will help you avoid pitfalls. Right. Exactly. That is so important. Just asking yourself questions, honestly, can solve all your writing problems yeah it can observing and seeing what works and seeing what doesn't yeah for sure definitely check out my video on we'll link it below if we can remember my video on pinch points because that's kind of a lot of what we've talked about today but also just suspense and examples of suspense story examples of suspense in that video that are very good um uh, one more thing that came to my mind that especially if you're writing a character that you're just in that one person's point of view, another thing you can do is based off their personality. Personality can create a lot of suspense if we know that a character always reacts this certain way to things and we see this behavior perpetuated, then we know like, oh, this thing's, this situation starts formulating and now we're like, how are they going to react to that? Yeah. Their personality and... um uh character flaws can really create anticipation because you're like oh i know how that person's right. gonna respond to that so you like know what they're gonna face yes. and you know who they are so actually that's another thing it's a more yeah. subtle form more of subtle. suspense but it can really add to it i was thinking about that recently because we recently watched the film the king's speech and that's a great example of that yes because you know he's going to have to make this speech in the end you see him struggling to make speeches the whole time. And so the stakes are set and you know what this is going to involve. Yes. And you never really leave his point of view. I mean, you follow the speech therapist a bit, but you really are just in the king's point of view. Mm -hmm. And so because those stakes have been set, you know what the rules are. You know what the, the whole stage is set and you're anticipating the final scene where he gives the speech and you're like, kind of on the edge of their seat like is it's gonna be yeah. a, is this gonna be a success or not right that's you know? a great that's a great uh, example because that has right. building anticipation through the whole thing which is so interesting because if you saw like any other movie where some important person gives a speech over the radio you would just be like yeah whatever this is kind of a boring sequence but the, the writer of that film was able to make that like build that up to be the climax Right. <laughs> like the thing and everybody's it was, it was anticipating. awesome. Excellent yeah, film. It's like, excellently done. Yeah. If you want an example of like subtly <laughs> building crazy anticipation, perfect example. Yeah. With something that most people would think like, that's how is that suspenseful? But you can make anything suspenseful if you create the right setting around it. You raise the stakes. You make this, you make these uh, elements and these I don't even know the word. <laughs> like, these are the stakes sort of right. thing, you know? It doesn't have to be some, like, epic, grand, crazy adventure, exciting, and explosions, and war. And it doesn't have to be any of that. It can be something, like, very simple, mm -hmm. you know? And you can raise the stakes even within a small, simple premise. Yeah. This is what I'm trying to say. Absolutely. So, yeah. Um, so... We, we talked a lot about this. <laughs> yeah, I had a lot um, to say about this one. Yeah, hopefully you guys got some value out of that. Hopefully you got value out of that, Leah, as well. Um, yeah, thanks for the great question. Yes, totally. And um, the quote that I found for to end with today's podcast is an Alfred Hitchcock quote, which is, I think, derived from the quote I read in the Pinch Point video that I want you to check out, which is, there is no terror in the bang only in the anticipation of it. So that has to do with the bomb under the table analogy. But good good rule of thumb to remember. You want to terrify your readers and get them on the edge of their seat. You have to make them anticipate what's going to happen. That's what creates 
the suspense. Mm-hmm. So, boom, that's it. If you enjoyed this episode of The Kate and Abby Show, share it with a writer friend and give us a good rating. We always appreciate that. Again, thank you to our patrons. You guys keep us going. You keep this show going. So if you get value out of this show, go to patreon.com slash the Kate and Abby show and help us keep this show alive and free of interruptions. Also, be sure to check out the video version of this podcast. If you haven't seen that already, you can find that on Kate's YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash K.A. Emmons. And um, you can find a ton of writing resources on my channel as well, which is youtube.com slash Abby Emmons. Until next time, stay stoked and rock on.